office to which you have been summoned for some unknown reasons, one of those large old dark offices with heavy carpeting on it and draped windows and dark wood, and the only light in the office is a, a banker's lamp, a green banker's lamp behind which this massive man sits behind an aircraft carrier sized desk. And as you walk in, he doesn't even look at you, he just motions you to a chair as he reads his multitudinous papers. And finally, finally he looks up and appraises you over gold-rimmed half glasses perched on the end of his nose. And he sighs deeply. What are you feeling at that moment? Well, imagine how Moses felt when he was summoned into God's office. In Exodus, our Old Testament reading, we have Moses brought up to God, the judge, the almighty, the all-powerful. Among other things, he's brought in to give him some rules for the people of God who are about to inherit the promised land, to demand an offering, if you read the rest of the context around our text for tonight, and to give instructions for the building of the tabernacle where God would dwell. We have a very different meeting, though, in our New Testament, in our Gospel for today. There we see Peter, James, and John also summoned into the inner chamber, but things were very different for them. In, the, in Exodus, Moses is told under which circumstances the people of God would live and under which circumstances they would die in the promised land. Sort of like being called into that attorney's office and being told that you're going to be indicted. But under certain circumstances, you may only live life in prison and in other circumstances, you may face the death penalty. In Matthew, though, it's very different. Peter, James, and John get to see their Lord revealed in all of his glory, and they begin to grasp that this news is very good. For them, it is as though that big, scary attorney smiled broadly at you and told you that you are the heir to a vast fortune and that the limousine is running outside waiting to take you to your mansion. You did not personally know the deceased. You did not do anything to earn this gift. You do not have to do anything to receive this gift. Whoever it was, he died, and he named you heir to billions of dollars. That's what Jesus is telling us on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, if you're about my age... You grew up with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And you probably understand this dream well. Willy Wonka and Charlie are sailing across the sky in the glass elevator. And Willy Wonka says to Charlie, Now Charlie, don't forget what happened to the man who got everything he wanted. And Charlie says a little ominously, what happened? And Willy Wonka says, he lived happily ever after. <laughs> that was the dream that we dreamed as children in the late 60s and early 70s. In the, in the midst of the, the Vietnam War and a growing recession, we just wanted to live happily ever after like Charlie. 
Our fathers and our brothers and our neighbors were overseas fighting a war that many people didn't seem to understand, and we were struggling with massive inflation and gas shortages. And it's just not surprising that a story about a poor child in a precarious family situation living happily ever after would play really well in this country about that time. But see, the thing is, you and I know that living happily ever after is not that simple. Over the years, we have known people who have come into great wealth and have been made even more miserable. Some have lost everything due to mismanagement. We've seen actors and, and musicians who, due to the luxuries that great wealth affords, have died of drugs and alcohol. We know that great wealth only adds risk and responsibility. It does not help us to live happily ever after. And yet, there always remains that little nagging voice in the back of our heads that's telling us that if we just had something more, we could be more happy. But that's a lie. There is nothing this world offers of which more would increase our happiness by any degree. What allows us to live happily ever after is what the disciples heard on that Mount of Transfiguration when God spoke out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And so we listen. We listen to what Jesus says throughout the Gospels. And we understand that we have been made heirs. Heirs to the greatest fortune ever known to this earth. Heirs to a greater kingdom than we ever imagined. And once you wrap your faith around that miracle, you no longer need and you no longer want many of any of the things this world has to offer. You think about it. Worldly riches rust and rot. They have no lasting glamour. In the end, they're just shiny bits of glass that distract us, cause us to lose focus. And death Death, that thing that so many people fear, so many people grab and grasp at every little shiny bit to try to avoid. Death for us loses all of its fear, all of its ferocity, all of its terror, all of its sadness. Because we understand that death for us is the door to paradise. It is a little bit like that attorney's office. It's kind of intimidating because it's something every one of us has to do alone. And uh, all of us only do it once. So for everybody, it's the first time. But Jesus is clear. Because of his payment for our sins when he died on that cross, because of his suffering hell in our place, death is the door to paradise for us. Once you walk through that door, you are living happily ever after. Peter had a family back in Bethsaida, maybe a wife and children, we don't know. We do know he had a mother-in-law, and so we assume that there was probably other family and friends there, and yet... Just the briefest little glimpse of Jesus in all of his glory up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he was ready to leave everybody and everything behind. He was ready to build some tents and just live the rest of his time up on that mountain with Jesus. It's how it is when you wrap your faith around that word of God. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. 
And as you hear and as you study his word, as you receive the very body and blood of Christ, as you remember your baptism, you live in that presence of Christ and your faith grows. And then as your faith grows, you begin to embrace this truth that you are a co-heir with Christ to the promised land. You already have wealth that this world can never comprehend. And worldly goods are only useful to you to the extent that they help you witness God's kingdom to others so that they may come to have what you already have been given. And once you truly believe that, earthly riches are just of no interest to you. Once you truly believe that, you start living a resurrected life even before the day of the resurrection. You begin to live as a prince or a princess of the kingdom even before your official reign starts. You begin to live happily ever after. <clears throat> 